as Lauren said, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, technologies. You know, so for example, uh, yesterday we we went a little more maybe about some of the philosophy uh, and some of the higher level pieces. I'm going to peel back at least one layer of of the onion. Um, of course, given time constraints and um, uh, you know, the fact that I have to keep everybody awake, I'm not going to go too deep. Uh, but what I've tried to do in a lot of these slides is give a lot of the details, which I'll kind of skip when I'm presenting. Uh, certainly feel free to ask questions. And uh, if need be, feel free to, to interrupt if there's uh, something that you didn't quite get or, 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 or notice. All right, so let's dig in. Uh, and of course, you know, this is about technologies for resource sharing. So I wanted to kind of re repeat uh, this uh, maybe mission statement uh, from yesterday. You know, OSG is a consortium dedicated to the advancement of all of open science through the practice of DHTC and the advancement of its state of the art. So in particular, uh, the reason why we care uh, is that the, the DEHTC technologies uh, enable us to effectively uh, enable resource sharing. And right now we have about a hundred different sites or, or clusters in, in the US that are able to share and pool these resources uh, through these technologies. So of course, uh, when we say a site on the OSG, uh, we mean some sort of collection of resources. Some of these may be GPUs, some of these may be CPUs. They may be sitting all in one um, machine room. They may be scattered throughout campus, but we kind of think of them as, as running this as within a single domain. So for example, at, at the University of Nebraska, uh, there's a Holland Computing Center site um, maybe another example, since a number of you mentioned uh, CC Star, uh, that maybe your CC Star awardee that would like to make their compute cluster uh, available to LIGO and, and backfill uh, for other scientific work through the through the OSG. So what we want to do, what I want to do again today, is explain how uh, we run a, a fabric of capacity services and how this allows sites to share those resources with external communities. So whether that community is the open science pool we've mentioned a couple of times, whether it is uh, LIGO or whether it's one of the big computing or big uh, LHC communities, uh, we want to go through how the bit about how this process works. So, you know, a particular interest to CC Star awardees uh, there's this commitment to uh, try to share 20% of your resources uh, with an external entity or, or community. And this would be one way to accomplish this. And, and again, uh, while Lauren talked and, and uh, Frank mentioned as well yesterday uh, how, the, how this looks for users, today I'm going to take a site-centric view. What does, what does this look like to your site or to your campus? how this might uh, impact your existing cluster. So if there's one thing I want everybody to take home from today is the concept of an overlay pool. And, and, and sometimes mentally, I find this concept a little bit easier to think about uh, if you think of something like uh, uh, cloud computing in terms of Amazon or, or Azure, uh, what we do is we send in requests. And again, an analogy here, maybe this is a request to Amazon to start a VM. Um, and when that request starts, we often refer to this as a glide-in uh, or a pilot. And what we've started inside that resource we requested uh, is effectively uh, a, a batch worker node. So uh, we're, we're starting worker nodes and all of these uh, different sites and all of them connect to some central location. So uh, again, a great analogy is if you have multiple clouds where you're launching VMs uh, and all those VMs are worker nodes that connect back to uh, a central manager for a resource pool. Uh, so those are, again, what we call pilots. And uh, then of course, once all these pilots have checked into the central location, 
uh, they can get assigned work from different uh, schedulers. And then in our terminology, that, that work, which is then the scientific payload job or scientific jobs, uh, we refer to as payloads. So again, uh, effectively all the, the different uh, technical pieces that I'm gonna go over today are all about uh, starting these overlays or starting these glide ends and adding resources to a central pool. And once that central pool has resources, then we run neurons. So uh, the, the two biggest pieces of technology, if you look through our documentation and uh, see some acronyms or jargon, uh, the two big pieces you'll see most often in terms of compute are Condor. And Condor is the software that's going to manage our pool of resources. Uh, and then you'll also see one called Gliden WMS. And Gliden WMS uh, will tend to be more invisible to sites. You won't see any of these processes running, but it's what we run centrally to decide when and where to, to allocate resources. So if we see that we have some jobs uh, that uh, can run at Nebraska, it's Gliden WMS is the piece that looks and says, hey, I need to start up more resources at Nebraska and uh, figures out how to do that. So if you have looked at Condor before, uh, you know, I, I did want to connect a little bit to the, the pieces of jargon. So if, you, if you're familiar with Condor, uh, what we're deploying on the different sites uh, inside the, the worker node is a, a, a start D. Uh, and then the name of the Condor daemons uh, that we run, that the open science pool runs centrally are the collector uh, connection broker and, and negotiator. Uh, in particular, and, and apologies if the font's too small, uh, we're not actually starting the uh, worker nodes inside a VM, but rather submitting the worker nodes inside your batch system. Uh, so if you're running Slurm, what you see when you accept these pilot jobs or the Glide-in jobs what you will see running on your system are Condor worker node processes. So uh, you'll see a, a shell script to start things up. You'll see Condor helper daemons uh, that uh, manage the, the Condor worker node. And then finally, you'll see any parts of a, a payload job or, or jobs. And it's important to note, for example, if, if you decide what's best for your site is to allocate eight cores at a time, you may see up to eight payload jobs running inside. And you might see multiple payloads running one after another. So, so even though you may see one pilot job that ran for 24 hours, there might be a dozen or a hundred different payloads that ran inside. And, and the reason I emphasize this point is particularly for sysadmins who like to look at the process tree of what's happening on their worker nodes, you're, you're typically going to see more processes than you would otherwise see in the batch system. And that's due to this overlay process uh, as we get, data, or get uh, the overlays running inside the batch system. So of course, uh, if we were starting these in the cloud, uh, we would be talking to some Amazon uh, API uh, in order to launch VMs. And accordingly, if we're gonna start it inside the site's batch system, we need some sort of API to externally talk uh, to that batch system. And what we've traditionally used is what we call uh, a CE or a compute entry point. This is how these external systems, such as the, the piece of software I mentioned, Glide and WMS, get onto your site. And the traditional way that we ran this is we use a piece of software called the Condor CE. Uh, you'll notice that uh, often we, we use Condor in many different forms within, the C, within OSG, uh, but we use this Condor CE software. Uh, a site would set up uh, a host or a VM. Uh, they would look at our documentation pages uh, and uh, figure out how to install the software start the service, configure the service, monitor the service, uh, and, and so forth. And 
one thing we, we've learned over the years is that depending on how interested or invested the site is, uh, sometimes running and managing and feeding this API is a lot to ask when, of course, all of us are, are very busy and have a lot of competing interests. So what we typically run today for most sites is what we refer to as the hosted uh, CE. And in this case, uh, we run all of these processes externally. Uh, so all the, the Condor pieces, any of the accounting pieces, everything that integrates it with the OSG ecosystem gets run offsite. Uh, particularly, we run most of these at the University of Chicago. And then uh, we connect to the site over SSH. So the Condor CE reaches uh, through a single IP address to uh, log in with SSH and then over SSH does all the interactions with the batch system, uh, very similar to how it would interact with the batch system if you were running this on site. So I'm gonna talk about that mostly today uh, and, and how that works and how that uh, may impact or may need to, to be planned for. I did want to mention that for sites that run uh, Kubernetes already, uh, there's also an option for OSG to operate the service, but the service to actually run on site. And, and there's a, a handful of sites uh, that, that run things like this, uh, for example, TAC. And one thing, of course, if there's multiple options, you know, you have to decide which one's best for you. And the trade-offs tend to be around uh, how much configuration does the site control? So the traditional deploy means that the site controls everything top to bottom because they do all the work uh, versus how much time the site admin needs to invest. And here they, the hosted option is, is really the way that uh, you have minimal time or minimal site investment uh, to install and operate things. In the end, all you really need to do is be able to offer that offsite SSH connection. Again, uh, the hosted CE uh, will log in uh, to your uh, site uh, through SSH, uh, depending on what communities you want to support. Again, there may, you may say LIGO, or you may say OSG, or you may want to support Atlas. Uh, each unique uh, community comes in under a different Unix account. So if you have three different communities, uh, you would expect three different accounts uh, logging in. And you can decide how you want to then prioritize uh, or if you want ban uh, each of those communities without affecting the, the other. Uh, typically, uh, since there were a number of people that mentioned that they were CC star awardees, most of them have been uh, coming in uh, as um, uh, supporting just the OSG community. So most people have just enabled uh, one Unix account. And again, that OSG community, uh, to, to remind you of what we mentioned yesterday, uh, somewhat confusingly, sorry, sometimes terminolo terminology is difficult, is the OSG community. We also refer to it as OSG. And, and that's the open science pool. And that's the one that mostly redistributes resources and has an emphasis on single PI uh, groups. Uh, beyond that, there are uh, ways that you can get ex exceed allocations for that community, and it can also include scientific collaborations. And I do want to mention, you know, we, we can host the CE uh, and we can provide these different pilots showing up as different communities. Uh, but if you want uh, help with your batch system, if you want advice or uh, input on how to configure things to implement your policy the best, uh, we do have uh, a number of people who are experts at different uh, batch systems. And if you know, we, we always love for people to come in and say, I want to do this in terms of configuring my batch system and sharing resources with OSG, how do I get that done? And that's one of our, our favorite conversations to engage on. 
So to give the, the rest of the picture, uh, again, your site sees this hosted CE and running on the worker nodes, uh, you'll see uh, these pilot processes and Condor worker, uh, worker nodes. Uh, and the rest of the, this is the uh, Glide and WMS system. And effectively what this does is there is a component that each of these communities installs that looks at what jobs, what job mixes they have. And that's what we call the front end. And then we have a, a, another central component called the factory that takes all the input and looks at all the possible sites on the OSG and decides which jobs uh, or which sites should receive pilots and, and how many. So for example, if LIGO says, I only want this job to run at Caltech, uh, the factory knows how to look at the job and say, hey, I need to start up a pilot at Caltech because I need resources there, but I don't need to start up a pilot, uh, say at MIT, because LIGO doesn't have any jobs that can run at MIT. So Glide and WMS is the system that we use that, to try to make sure that if we ask for resources from the site, those resources are actually used by uh, the various communities. Now, again, what does this look at uh, in terms of your SSH host? Uh, so on the, the login host, uh, you'll see two persistent SSH connections per community. Uh, one of these connections is going to interact with your batch system. The sorts of things that we'll need to do are submit the pilot jobs, look at the status of pilot jobs, remove them if they're no longer needed. And the other one is for file movement. And, and that's going to uh, get the, uh, the log files of the pilot jobs themselves uh, to and from uh, the OSG. It's an important thing to note uh, that the uh, scientific jobs, the payload jobs, go directly from the central services to the worker nodes. And the, the, the pilot jobs files, whether they're the input data, or sorry, the, the payload job files, so those scientific jobs, the input data and the output data, again, go from worker node uh, to the, um, directly to the central systems. And the only thing that gets moved back and forth through the SSH host are just these outer uh, wrapper files or log files. So other sorts of activities you'll see at the site. Uh, so we, we went over the submit host activities. Um, we, the worker nodes, because they're reaching out to the central system, do need outgoing network connectivity. So that, so that is the processes sitting on the worker node are gonna open TCP connections uh, to the central pool. So this works perfectly well uh, with NAT uh, and, and works well with most site firewalls. Uh, in fact, at some sites that are, are more restrictive uh, we do have, for many of these communities, uh, the outgoing IP addresses. Uh, now, some communities keep very close tabs on these and others do not. And, and really the, the simplest way to, to get things going is to, to uh, allow all outgoing uh, traffic for these jobs. Again, the only inbound connections from OSG, so the only thing sitting on the outside that's gonna contact your site is through SSH uh, on the login host. Uh, another thing that uh, occurs on the site is to get jobs started and for us to get the log files back for these pilots, uh, there is a shared file system that would be needed uh, between uh, the submit host and the worker nodes. Uh, and, and, that's, uh, and for Condor sites, we can even skip that. Now, all this is, I'm, or, or I'm describing kind of the minimal things that are needed uh, for the open science pool to be able to, to utilize and share resources. If you want to support other science communities, 
some of them require some additional services. Uh, so for example, the LHC uh, really pushes a lot of the scale and uh, complexity. So for the LHC, you're gonna have a, a bigger investment to support Atlas or CMS versus just uh, setting up the, the open science pool. And as you start going, you know, again, my, my uh, suggestions always uh, start simple, get something running and uh, kind of get science happening on the, the cluster and then build up. Uh, but do let us know uh, if you have any plans to support, you know, be a part of LIGO, say, uh, and we can direct you to the right people and the right contacts and, and provide you uh, any additional details. In terms of getting started, uh, the, the best thing to do is strike up a conversation with us at support at opensciencegrid.org. Uh, this would schedule a discussion with the OSG team. Uh, we'd like to sit down and kind of have a meeting first to figure out what services we are gonna target for the site, uh, what staff we want to bring in in terms of providing advice and where the site's meet, needs might be, you know, where, uh, what can we bring to bear? Uh, technically, we do have a, a simple questionnaire uh, that gets us going with some basic technical facts about your site that helps save us a couple round trips. And, and then one thing I do want to emphasize is uh, contact us early. Uh, you don't need to have the batch system working or even the hardware bot and on site to start the conversation and start the planning process. We're, we're happy to come in uh, at any time uh, and there, there's no need to wait till the end. We love questions. We love to hear from sites. Uh, finally, if you want to do a little bit more reading uh, at the bottom there, there's also a link to the online documentation. So that's the first big whirlwind. Um, I did want to pause here uh, since there's, you know, conceptually a lot of times the, the overlay concept is pretty new. And I wanted to stop and say, basically, do we have uh, any questions? Does, does anybody want, I noticed nobody interrupted me. So I want to maybe give a moment of silence for you to interrupt. I, thank you, Brian, that, that was great. I, I want also to encourage everyone to uh, ask us or point out to our things that they believe we cannot do. We, we like to be pushed in new direction if we know that there are uh, users or customers out there. So if you conclude that something is missing or you wish it was there, please uh, let us know, uh, complain, whatever, that, that will help us to improve. Yeah, you know, there are a number of kind of R&D or new items that we're doing and, and working on at, at any given time. So what I'm showing here are the things that we know to do well, and it's our bread and butter. Uh, but don't be scared off if you want to try something that's not listed, because it might be something we're already working on, and we're just not quite ready to, to show it to the entire world but would love to have uh, new users or, or people that are interested. Yeah, plus, um, as mentioned yesterday, we typically dive into those and move them up the priority chain when we have an interested partner that can be a guinea pig. So for example, we're, we're now working with a site that's local OS is Ubuntu so that we can add the ability for uh, the OSG software to fill in on Ubuntu clusters. There's one question in the chat already from uh, Jacob, and you can unmute yourself if you'd like, Jacob. Yeah, so I was wondering about uh, some of the applications that may come with your own file system. I'm thinking of uh, Apache and the Hadoop, Hadoop, Hadoop file system. Uh, is it possible uh, to run jobs with such setup on uh, the HTC condo system. I'm thinking of a situation where on the same campus, you have probably a number of servers and somebody's running job with a certain amount of data and being distributed across um, systems. Can you do that? Or has anybody done that? I don't know. 
Yeah, there, there's, I, I know at least of one demo for that, but um, what's going to be a, a little more successful is to, to try to uh, take these jobs and, and try to uh, extract uh, what exactly they're trying to accomplish and uh, put them into uh, Condor. So uh, again, going back to yesterday, the, the interface that we provide uh, users right now is kind of access to a Condor submit endpoint uh, through, uh, through a SSH login. Um, so it's gonna be really hard on the user to, to wrap up something quite as long, large as uh, Hadoop and, and HDFS and get things working. Um, I, I would definitely try something simpler at, at first uh, shot. Uh, that said, uh, I'm not gonna talk about data management today and, and how people get their data uh, and, and do data processing uh, right now, but that's something we can follow up, you know, kind of what paradigms people use uh, a, a little bit later. Uh, Lauren, if I remember right, Frank is going to cover at least some of these topics, but I, I don't know if he's going to go very deep on. Data. No, Frank is going to Frank is going to cover you know implications of what jobs need. I think you are too um, for sites, since that's our focus today. Um, Jacob, what I might do is move this question up to the HT Condor area and let some of the HT Condor developers weigh in as well. But um, Brian made a really good point that um, I can elaborate on a bit we frequently find that um, a lot of uses of Hadoop, at least in some campuses that we know that have, have deployed Hadoop systems are using Hadoop for problems that are not necessarily map reduced, but are high throughput. And there are some assumptions made by Hadoop or tools like Spark um, that sort of force you to state your problem as a map reduced problem, even when it isn't necessarily that, and Condor doesn't make those assumptions or require those those sort of modifications and the sort of structuring of the problem. So it, it might be, like Brian said, really useful to um, meet with that researcher if, if they're really used to Hadoop and see if um, your local system might provide them advantages over what they've been using in the past. Um, but maybe Greg and Todd in the discussion document um, could comment a bit further on their knowledge of integration of Hadoop and Apache with local Condor systems. And that's a, the exact kind of question we like uh, to, to hear from researchers or, you know, uh, to, to come up and, and talk with the facilitators that say, here's what I have, here's the science I'm trying to accomplish, you know, here's what, what how it exists now, how could this work on OSG? It's typically, you know, given a science problem, say, how would I do this on OSG? Uh, it's a little bit easier to provide a, a, a question than, or provide an answer to the question uh, than just the kind of the generic, uh, you know, can it be done? Because fortunately, like all these sort of things, the answer is it depends. Yeah, another way to put it is, you know, all map reduce problems are high throughput in nature, but not all high throughput problems are map reduce. Okay. Um, so I, I did want to, um, and again, we have some time for discussion afterwards as well. Um, I, I wanted to move on and uh, talk a little bit and make a couple notes about security. Uh, and, and of course, this is, can be non-exhaustive, uh, you know, again, because I, I don't want to, to put everybody to sleep. But what I want to say and want to emphasize is the way we view security uh, is as an important process that's required for establishing mutual trust between parties. Um, and we tend to think really uh, about security one-sided in terms of, you know, the, what does the site need for security? But OSG for us, it, it's important both for the sites and, and the users. So this term, uh, OSG acts as a, a trusted middleman. Uh, so we establish uh, identity and relationships with sites. Uh, we make sure we help make sure sites are secure or known entities uh, and uh, understand and follow the acceptable use policies. And similarly, we also turn around and do a lot of the same thing with communities. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are accepting valid science and working with established communities. 
And the idea is by trusting the OSG, each site doesn't need to go sit down with LIGO and try to understand whether, you know, how LIGO's infrastructure works. Uh, so we act to some extent as a trusted middleman and can transitively establish trust between sites and uh, scientific collaborations or, or even down to the researchers uh, without making a lot of work for those sites. Uh, and this is important, right? Uh, this, uh, you know, certainly uh, probably anybody who got you the computing resources had some sort of strings attached, right? You know, if, if they're federally funded or if they're funded through the campus, those funders have the right to know that their resources that they purchased are used for the advancement of say science and engineering and uh, not necessarily for mining Bitcoin or any of the other uh, horror stories that uh, you might encounter. And, you know, the sorts of things that OSG does to, to do this is, is um, for example, the facilitation teams meets with each user in the OSG open science community over video to help establish identity. So for, for us, it's really important that we can uh, establish this mutual trust so we can't, and that allows us uh, to, to really practice DHTC and uh, uh, get science done. And again, on the flip side, communities uh, such as LIGO wants to know that their computing is being performed on valid recognizable resources. You know, uh, LIGO does not want any of their discoveries going out to untrusted third parties or or random people uh, on the internet. So it's it's really a two way uh, street, as they say. There's a number of technical mechanisms in, in place uh, to protect your site. Uh, I just highlight three here, but the list goes on. Uh, so for example, Trusted CI, which is the NSS Cyber uh, Security Center of Excellence, uh, has performed an assessment of the security of the Condor CE itself. Our containers are, are always uh, periodically rebuilt to pick up the latest Red Hat security patches. So we have good practice there from that side. Uh, we, in order to uh, submit jobs, again, for the hosted CE, we need a SSH private key. That's of course uh, accessible only to the operations team and uh, used from specific narrow IP ranges. Uh, all the communication is encrypted. Uh, for the most part, we use mutual TLS or X509 based authentication to establish identities. And we're starting to also use uh, JWTs as a way to establish authentication. And then, you know, of course, our services are all periodically scanned uh, for vulnerabilities. So again, the list goes on, but what I want to say is we, we have various technical mechanisms in place. And even though our uh, security officer isn't giving a full talk here, uh, he's available to ask questions and, or sorry, to answer questions uh, in case if your site has specific concerns or want to know more about uh, what we do on the, the technical side. And we have expectations and responsibilities for, for sites as well. Uh, if there is a security incident response, we expect sites to participate in the incident response and be responsive as needed. Uh, we have an expectation that sites notify OSG if there's been a local uh, incident, uh, particularly any that affect the grid level components. And we expect you know, the site to, to also obey best practices in order to maintain a secure local environment. Uh, that can mean things like uh, keeping a host's patch and up to date, uh, keeping log files and maintaining traceability of what's happening at your site and then maybe even monitoring network activity for, for suspicious or uh, unknown traffic. And again, this is important for us because OSG users are expecting us to make sure or to, to, to ensure that the sites are, are, are safe. Uh, they're trusting us often with uh, their scientific data. They're trusting us with their credentials and to some extent their scientific reputation so they wanna know that the sites are also meeting their responsibilities. So uh, security often uh, generates a lot of questions. I just wanted to pause there for a second and uh, 
hear from anybody who might uh, have specific concerns. Uh, we had some new questions show up in the discussion document, um, one from Purdue. And I don't know who it's from, but I'll read it verbally. And then that person is welcome to unmute themselves and comment further. Hey, I, um, I just unmuted. Oh, go for it. It's Eric. So, hey, Eric. Hey, Brian. So, um, we have a CC Star Award to build uh, a Kubernetes based uh, cluster, and we're going to share cycles with OSG. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could comment on like a CE less uh, OSG setup. I saw you have a like an OSG VO Docker pilot available. Um, is, is that a viable method to to share cycles in a Kubernetes-based environment? Yeah, in fact, I, so I, I didn't cover that because you know, just like I said last time, it's one of these services that's a little bit on the new side, and and maybe we're not 100% ready for every single site to use that. Uh, but we we do uh, have a Docker image that contains a uh, OSG pilot, uh, and then uh, we can also, you know, delegate credentials to you to be able to start that pilot and join the pool. And this has been used by a number of sites. And, and the question is then, how do you as a site decide to start or not start those pilots? Uh, because that's, of course, one of the things that CE does is, you know, the CE provides this signaling path from the OSG of, hey, why go could use some more work? Or hey, we have open pool jobs that are ready for you. So uh, what's, what we've seen done before specifically inside Kubernetes is uh, set up, uh, um, let's see if I get it right, as uh, not state for a uh, daemon set uh, as a, uh, uh, within the site with a very low priority so whenever Kubernetes actually has other jobs to run, it will uh, preempt the pilot, or the, sorry, the OSG pod and read whatever else it needs uh, that, that node for. So uh, there's at least one site, University of Chicago, that uh, has about a 3,000 core Kubernetes cluster. And they use this specific uh, backfill mechanism to, to always start and run pilot or OSG pods. So probably the the only thing that you'd be missing, since it sounds like you already found the container, is to uh, follow up with the, the support address and get uh, credentials, uh, because of course the the credentials are are not embedded in the container itself. Hey, um, I I would like to to follow up here and to stay for a moment a little bit above the the technology. A part of what uh, Brian. Uh, it brought up is the question of who launches the glidens or the pilot. So the current model is that we do it via the CE based on a pressure that we see. We are very interested in talking to campuses that said we will decide uh, how much we provide now and make it available. And for example, in, in, a, in a Kubernetes setting that you run pods that are basically glidens, and then you use your own uh, controller to decide how many of them should run at any time. And we will use the one that you make available to us. So, uh, and then we can provide you whatever support and tools that you need to manage it. We are doing this today, for example, with Jetstream, and because we can do the same with virtual machines rather than with container. Yeah, so that's one example of a CE-less uh, resource sharing. And I, I think of, um, there, there's been a number throughout the years, and, and uh, to be honest, I think some of the Kubernetes-based ones have, have worked the best. There are other models though. Cool, great, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna run a little bit out of time. So I'm gonna flip through this next section quickly. Um, and basically the, the take home is uh, we do 
uh, resource accounting uh, on, on your on OSG services. Uh, and this is maybe a little targeted to CC Star since this is a number of CC Star sites have asked about this. Um, so uh, the CC Star program aims to make available 20% of the resources to external communities. Uh, now making available and what constitute 20% it's a really hard thing to do. And uh, we're, we're not the police. Uh, and uh, however you want to make that argument, we can help and provide insights and kind of uh, explain how people view this. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is we can help provide some data for making uh, your argument. So um, we record uh, resource usage in two ways. Uh, we can tell you what we sent to the batch system. So what, how many uh, glidens or pilots we ran and how long they ran for. And then uh, we can also tell you uh, for particularly the open science pool, how the communities that those pilots are associated with use the resources. Uh, so basically from say the, the open science pool, how many hour, usable hours did those users uh, uh, get? Uh, now, in the ideal case, those two numbers are the same, right? The, the number of hours things start up should be the same as the number of hours uh, that get used. Uh, but there's a lot of cases where they're not. Uh, although I'd, I'd say for, for the most part, those two numbers are within 10% of each other. Uh, and those are, if you have any questions, we, we love to kind of go dig in deep, uh, but I did want to let everybody know that we do have those two different ways uh, to do accounting uh, and, and think and help provide input for you uh, if you want to know how your resources are used, what fields of science they go to, what the, the projects are, or kind of descriptions of, of the science that's getting done. Uh, I know some people love just to sit down and look at that list of all the different areas and subjects uh, that their clusters are working on. A few notable gotchas on this um, is that uh, some communities uh, don't provide all the same details of how they're using it as the open science uh, pool does. And certainly, say LIGO keeps their own community accounting in a different internal portal uh, than say OSG does. So, um, and, and then of course, in terms of making all these number ad adds up, uh, some of these communities also will utilize OSG to reach non-US sites, uh, which again is maybe some other things that can be confusing to look at this monitoring. Um, accordingly, uh, it's, a wonderful idea to come ask us and try to define exactly what you would like to see. Um, and then as opposed to kind of blindly clicking around uh, through the different accounting systems. Uh, for the sake of time, I am gonna skip through walking through the, the accounting system. The slides are posted on uh, the, the workshop uh, website, but the, these are just example screenshots of different views of the information. And finally, uh, I want to mention a little bit about some other OSG services. Uh, so again, integrating the CE is absolutely the simplest way to start resource sharing. Absolutely start there if you're just getting uh, into the, 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 the OSG ecosystem because it doesn't require you to run any uh, site level services. It really minimizes the, the footprint on the site. Uh, however, uh, by doing some additional steps, which are more involved, uh, your site will either be able to run jobs more efficiently, uh, or it may be able to support a broader range of jobs. Uh, and again, we, we do matchmaking between what users ask for and what sites offer. Uh, so for example, nearly all of our GPU users uh, run inside containers. And uh, so if you will have GPU resources, but you don't support containers at your local site, 
uh, then we may not actually have any jobs to run. So uh, there is kind of a, a limit to what we can provide in terms of scientific work uh, for those bare minimum sites. Uh, the good news is uh, that uh, we work every year to lower the bar. Uh, I'm gonna mention a couple places where things are, are getting pushed down further and further. And even for things like running containers, it's, it's much simpler today than it was uh, two years ago. So uh, these are a couple above and beyond things I want to mention, uh, but again, don't, don't feel compelled. So the four I wanted to, to mention are uh, HTTP caching, uh, and, and this allows data that's pulled in over HTTP repeatedly uh, to be cached at your site. So you only see that travel over the work or the wide area network a couple of times. Uh, we have different ways to uh, distribute uh, container images out to the worker nodes. Uh, and in fact, this is done as a global uh, read-only caching file system to, to move these containers out. And of course the data is translated over HTTP. Uh, we, if there are as a way to distribute containers, the actual container runtime we use is one called uh, Singularity. Uh, it's relatively popular within the, the research computing world. Uh, if you haven't seen it, the big difference between it and Docker is that Singularity can be run without any set UID privilege without and without any daemons or setup at, at your site. Um, so this, this is a much lower impact and much more batch system friendly way to start containers than say interacting with Docker. And then finally, we also have some large scale data caches uh, that are more optimized for data movements above one, one gigabyte. So in the next couple of slides, I'll include a lot more information and mostly links to these and we'll be happy to follow up where necessary. So again, the HTTP cache is there to uh, reuse data uh, locally at the site as opposed to pulling it over the WAN. This is one way to reduce the impact of OSG on your uh, wide area network. Uh, for this, the documentation we provide is for a particularly popular uh, HTTP cache called SWIB and a certain set of configurations for that. Uh, I would note that we can use any HTTP cache that your site might want to provide uh, but Squid is the one where we can provide expertise, help, advice. And, and sometimes the way that we interact with HTTP uh, might cause some other implementations to not cache the data. We're always happy to help there. Uh, this is relatively easy to run. It's a pretty simple service. It is a service to run. It is does have to run somewhere. So it is uh, kind of not for free. Uh, but one thing to note, again, going back to uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, this can be run on the local Kubernetes uh, by, by OSG staff. So if that's a particular set of technologies uh, your site's interested in, it is something that we can leverage to keep the complexity down for you. Uh, for container distribution, again, uh, we use a a particular uh, file system. Uh, you might have seen the acronym before mentioned, uh, CVMFS. Uh, and this starts to get up there in complexity. Uh, so it, it is a piece of software that runs on the worker node. And it, it's uh, historically had to be installed by the sysadmin. Uh, so this is one place where we're working hard uh, to reduce the complexity. Uh, in particular, starting now in CentOS 7, uh, it no longer requires any setup or configuration by uh, the, the sysadmin. And that uh, I'm expecting later this year, early next year to be it's something that OSG can do out of the box. So the, there's very little impact on the worker nodes for the container distribution. And then finally, for the container runtime itself, uh, again, we use something called Singularity, uh, particularly it's because it doesn't run 
uh, Docker, and it doesn't provide a potential privilege escalation in, in the way that Docker can sometimes do. Um, for how OSG uses Singularity, it doesn't actually even need uh, anything like set UID. Uh, if you go straight up to the Singularity documentation, uh, there are additional workflows that it does that might need this, but for the OSG use cases, there's no privilege needed. And uh, this will get invoked by the pilot and start the payload inside the container. And, and particularly that frees uh, a lot of these payload jobs from having to worry too much about what your host operating system is uh, because the payload sees the container and the operating system environment of its choice. Uh, so that frees us from saying, oh, dear Wisconsin, can you please install uh, this particular version of BLAST, or can you please install this math library? Uh, again, for OSG, it's really important that everything is portable and we have a very lightweight footprint at the site. And for more complex software, uh, having this container runtime is one way we do that. This, was, this has become a fairly uh, easy thing to do uh, since it no longer relies relies on elevated privileges uh, on RHEL 7. It's uh, as simple as enabling a certain configuration uh, in, in your, uh, inside uh, the file system. And if that configuration is enabled, uh, that's uh, the unprivileged user namespaces for the technical people out there, uh, then we actually download this and uh, as the unprivileged user. So it's very, it can be very lightweight on the sites. Uh, let, let me add here that what you are hearing from uh, Brian is this ongoing trade-off between our desire to minimize what we ask from the site while maximizing the value of the resources that the sites are contributing to the open science pool. So uh, it, it is an ongoing uh, struggle, if you want, to make the application as portable as possible and to make it as independent of the target site as possible. At the same time, we want to minimize the uh, overhead and challenge for the site that is contributing the resources. But the, an important working assumption here is that the sites who contribute the resource is motivated to have the, the resources used. We have one site that uh, came to me complaining very loudly, uh, saying I'm sick and tired of making all these resources available and you guys are not using it. So it, it, it is a partnership that we have all to work together. And uh, if a certain require not requirement, but a certain uh, option doesn't fit your site, then don't use it. On the other hand, if there is a way to make your site more attractive to the, the application, then we are here to, to help to make it happen. And, and my job as um, maybe the, the technology person is trying to make the trade-off easier to digest. I, I think I recognize a couple of the names on the list of participants and I think there's a really distinct, uh, or there's a big difference between OSG now versus OSG five years ago versus OSG 10 years ago that we, we have made serious effort and serious progress at making this easier on both the, the sites and the users. And then finally, uh, Frank mentioned the, the Data Federation uh, yesterday. And uh, this is yet another service that can be run uh, that uh, can, can really allow lots of large scale data processing. So 
uh, Frontier Squid, again, really targets smaller scale use cases. And we have this separate service we call XCash uh, that is designed for delivering about a, you know, one to 10 gigabytes of data to job, to, to modest, run, modest runtime jobs. Uh, and for workflows that are of a total working set size around uh, 10 terabytes. Uh, and then unlike normal HTTP caching, this also provides mechanism to keep data private and to authenticate and authorize access. Uh, although I should note that this still transfers data in the end over HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, this is a, one of the more complex uh, uh, pieces of software uh, in order to integrate it at the site level. Uh, therefore, I think almost all the instances are actually run on Kubernetes that are remotely managed by, by OSG staff. And in that case, the, the complexity really drops and becomes more approachable. This really allows a lot of those high data rate, uh, uh, more data intensive workflows and science use cases to be done at the site. So again, uh, if you leave with uh, nothing from the last uh, 30 minutes, I want to emphasize that idea of an overlay pool that we take your resources or we send resource allocation requests to your site. Uh, these are the pilot jobs and those allow us to overlay one giant nationwide resource pool and include your site in the resource sharing. Um, the way we get those requests into your site, again, is the compute entry point, uh, which either you can host on site or can be hosted off site, in which case you only need an SSH login. Uh, I want to again emphasize that uh, security is an important aspect of making this whole ecosystem work and that the security is a two-way street and involves uh, both the users and the, the sites in addition to the OSG. And that there's a number of these additional services uh, that can be run that can make your site or your site's users uh, more effective and run a, a wider range of jobs. And then I think we have some time for discussion. And uh, as always, uh, feel free to reach out to support at opensciencegrid.org uh, if you have any particular questions. Thanks.